Hello, I'm David Breeden. I'm the Senior Minister at First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis. And I have as a guest today, Dr. Ann Frisch of the Nonviolent Peace Force. We're gonna find out a little bit, what is a nonviolent peace force? Well, Nonviolent Peace Force is an international organization. We provide unarmed civilian peacekeepers um, to, in areas of violent conflict on invitation from the people who live there, the civilians who are needing protection. So it's, it's an unusual um, concept, basically, but we've been saying for years, civilians need protection. Uh, so we are men and women, peacekeepers, um, over 25, that's minimum age, but no maximum age, uh, working in areas of conflict where we have a partnership with, with the civilians in those communities. And we work on a nonpartisan basis. We are totally nonviolent. We use relationship building skills as our mainline security. So you go into areas uh, where there is potential violence and you aren't armed and you right. accept with the principle of nonviolence, I assume. I guess you could say uh, that. Okay, well, well what, is, what does that look like uh, to, to go into an area where people are trying to kill each other, and wh what do you do? Yes, and often this is in areas where there is already armed conflict. Um, not, not just the potential for it, but it could be sporadically uh, erupting violence, or it could be an ongoing violence. Uh, it could be something like Syria. Uh, we're working right now in Mindanao, Philippines, where we've been successfully mm. working. But you ask about how does this happen, um, we've been in Sri Lanka for nine years, working in various areas where there was violent conflict. And I was a peacekeeper in Guatemala during our one-year short-term uh, protection for human rights defenders during the elections. But typically what happens is people hear about us. People in armed conflict, they, they read the papers, they go to conferences, they, you know, they hear about us, and we somehow get a message for them, could, could you come and take a look and, and help us protect civilians? And so we, we send a team, and if we're very serious about it, we have to fund that, explore, we call it an exploration. So in Mindanao, for example, in 2007, we had a couple peacekeepers there just talking with local people about what the needs were, what the potential was, how they worked, and we typically find, uh, w when we decide to go someplace, it's because we have nonpartisan partners there. People who have invited us to, to come mm -hmm. and provide nonpartisan protection and nonviolent protection. So this is something we call civilian to civilian. It means hmm. the civilians there asked us, and we're all civilians, to come and protect them. It's really quite a, a neat concept. Yes, well, well it is. Now, is this an international organization? Yes. yes, we are an international organization. Have been right from the inception. Had our uh, opening convening meeting in India in 2002 with people all around the world. And these hmm. people, I evolved out of a study that we did of what was the need for unarmed civilian peacekeeping. And out of that emerged delegates from around the world, which eventually became our member organizations. So the basic of, uh, basis of our structure of our organization is member organizations. So we have people representing or, uh, countries all around the world, uh, organizations all around that have been very active as as nonviolent and nonpartisan organizations to to bring peace to their communities, so we they are in our, on our uh, governing board, and so they actually direct the organization and they hire the staff, and we have a, a small but very potent staff uh, that uh, selects peacekeepers and selects country directors and. Um, and then once we have decided that an area of violent conflict has potential for success, hmm. Hmm. Um, then we ask our governing board 
can, can we go ahead with this? And if they say yes, then we proceed to raise money. So it's always, can, can we raise the funds to do it? Because we, we are an organization of individual donors by just almost exclusively. Mm. So we fund these explorations. With a budget of $7 million, we have our whole total totality of our program in the world with about 200 staff, 170, 180 peacekeepers. Um, so we're doing a lot for $7 million. But out of the individual donations, the people like you and people like me, we, we fund the organization and then those explorations get done. And mm -hmm. we initiate a team there and we send peacekeepers. I was in Mindanao early uh, in 2008 and with six peacekeepers already doing really wonderful work in the community and, and um, talking with the armed parties. Because this is a situation where the, the fighting has been going on ever since Mindanao was taken into the Philippines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, leaving a whole lot of people feeling like they had no governing body, no representation. So they were fighting for some of the things that some people might call freedom fighters and other people call insurgents, rebels, and we just don't label them. Okay. But we interact with them. We have respect for the persons, even though we disagree with their strategies, which are violent. I, I kill you before you kill me. Mm -hmm. Those are mm -hmm. strategies we disagree with, but we still have respect for the persons. Okay. And we get okay. to know them. When you know the armed parties, then when there's a fight breaking out, you can call them, speak to them on a first name basis. You've sat in there. You get to know them. You, you, you've been in their offices, you, you exchange your kids' photos on your iPhones, and, and, and you look at the medals and, mm -hmm. and, the, and their certificates. And so they know you, and they know, as a peacekeeper, they know that we are nonpartisan, that we have no weapons, that we're not a threat. Okay, but so, so, but then you have to be able to speak the language then. Well, that's why we hire, we, uh, you know, as we said, the organization's international. So we hire internationally for peacekeepers. Okay. But we always hire in the area we're working, and sometimes very specific area of South Sudan, for example, where they speak certain languages, and we train those peacekeepers. So they become part of our peacekeeper team. I see. I they see. do the translation. They help us with the cultural sensitivity mm -hmm. because even if we knew all those languages, and some of these communities have two or three languages, mm -hmm. um, we would probably, as outsiders, we would probably never get it right <laughs> and make some big mistakes. So we have these wonderful national peacekeepers. They do the translation. They help us understand the social context, and um, we can do a very good job that way. They are really excellent people. All of our peacekeepers have to speak English. And the exception was when I was in Guatemala, we all spoke Spanish. That was the language mm -hmm. of the team. Mm -hmm. But even so, we had to get a translator several times to speak to indigenous communities where they oh, didn't okay. speak Spanish. Yes, 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 yes. Interesting, okay. Well, um, what's your background? I, I, I wanna figure out how someone gets to how this. How did I get there? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, I grew up with a mother who was quite a free thinker and a dad too, so we had a lot of conversations about politics at the dinner table. <laughs> okay. And I uh, went to the University of Michigan, Michigan State, which in, in, in itself is a great success given the competition between those two universities. <laughs> um, so I got a degree in human ecology. My PhD is in human ecology, which means you look at families from an ecological perspective. And actually, the, the origins of human ecology was in home economics, now broadened to include family studies and family therapy and policy. So they're all uh, put together in this systems perspective. So that has guided a lot of my thinking. It helps me see impacts and, and causes and benefits and effects in a way that, that other people aren't trained to do. Kind of a holistic so, look at, a, a at very the structures holistic look. of the social, okay. So right. 
but I also, you know, I grew up in this family, and so I was in the marches and the civil rights movements mm. and part of uh, the, the Quaker meeting in Ann Arbor, and, uh -huh. and I was at the University of Michigan, <clears throat> part of the Kangian Disciples Guild who had meetings around uh, the, the Vietnam War, and I was in some of those marches. I, I was not the brick thrower, but a lot of the, the marches were very peaceful. Mm -hmm. And um, I am also a social worker, so I've done the individual treatment and counseling and things like that. Uh, and I've taught those. Uh, so um, I retired from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh in 2006, looking for something to do, uh -huh. my, my new career, as it were. And I had somehow, I had heard a lecture on Nonviolent Peace Force, thought it was just great, and mm. got on the mailing list and started reading the newsletter. I thought, I'll just donate, I'll just give a few hours when I retire. And, <laughs> and then it turned out to be a, a real career shift for me. Even mm. though I work pro bono, uh, the nice thing about Nonviolent Peace Force, it's able to attract a lot of people to give their time, even though all the peacekeepers are paid. So this is, this is the good thing. All the peacekeepers are paid staff, paid professionals. Okay. But people like me, we work pro bono because it gives us a, sort of a, a, a mission, something we can do, something tangible to, to contribute, uh, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and we can do that. We're in a position to do that. Okay, so, so the, the average person who volunteers then is, is are, are they, or mostly pacifist then, or? No, not, not really. I don't think you could characterize them that way at all. Hmm. They're people who, uh, I think, first of all, they're probably people who are pretty tough, um, willing to, to live simply. Uh, some of our peacekeepers in South Sudan are living in tents. <laughs> um, the housing that I've seen is very plain. Nothing fancy, can't bring mm -hmm. your piano. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to have a certain kind of toughness about you, um, a, a, a way to deal with fear, because some of the conditions are pretty, can be mm -hmm. pretty frightening. Arm uh, sides they, are they scary. They have to be 25 years old, but we've had okay. people in their 70s, a uh, retired Serbian judge in Sri Lanka, 50-year-old uh, yeah. grandmother in Wisconsin, all doing really wonderful work, bringing their talents and skills. But Peacekeepers are all paid professionals. Okay. So they're professionals in their field, but they come to us and we train them in nonviolent, nonviolence and nonpartisan strategies, peacekeeping strategies for reducing violence. And, uh, and we do the same with our national peacekeepers. So they're all trained together. So what's the difference between pacifism and nonviolence then? Um, <clears throat> I, th I think you could say there, there is a, um, a, a principle of nonviolence, which means we never can commit harm on any other person. And then there's a strategic nonviolence, which means we use nonviolence because it works. Mm hmm Okay. Because it's more okay. effective. Okay. Some of our peacekeepers come from that position. They have not come grown up as I did with a commitment to nonviolence. I would say the organization only uses nonviolent strategies. So I guess you would have to put us in the, in the principled camp. We do it because it's the right thing to do. Okay. But some of the peacekeepers we hire may, may not be, I, I, maybe a few of them are pacifists, but I don't think they think of it that way. They think of it as serving the world. Um, uh, uh, caring, um, protecting human rights, protecting civilians. That I think that's how they're thinking about it, making a difference in the world. And uh, of course, many of them are committed to nonviolence. Whether in, when they get into the field, then we expect them to use nonviolent mm -hmm. strategies. Whether they're committed to it uh, as a, you always do this, or because it works either way. Uh, Okay, so, so they can be pragmatic in the- They in, can in, be in pragmatic about nonviolence, but when they're working for us, that's, those are the strategies they use. Okay, so, so the, the main goal then, as I'm hearing you, is that uh, when you go into an area, you want to get to know the people and have, get the people to, to get to know right. you. 
right. and develop personal relationships. Um, okay, so you hear about a shooting last night um, that happened, and uh, mm -hmm. what do you do? Um, we, we typically don't work in, on gang issues, and I'm, I'm not sure all well, what I, I was to meaning you're just giving me a hypothetical. Yeah, okay, hypothetical. Okay, just a yeah. hypothetical. Yeah. Um, well, I need to put this in the South Sudanese context okay. where um, I stayed with a peacekeeper and in long conversations, he, would, he was telling me that he lived over the fence from the police commissioner. And mm. because he knew all the people in town very well, and had led our team in, in, in uh, bridging the gap between um, the cattle keepers who migrate during the dry uh, season mm -hmm. and the farmers who are just trying to protect their cabbages. Mm -hmm. So sometimes in the middle of the night, maybe one of those cattle keepers walks into town with a couple head of cattle and somebody fearful that they're gonna come and get the cabbages mm -hmm. goes out with, a, with whatever, a rock, uh, an axe, whatever, and so the police commissioner would come and get uh, our peacekeeper uh, Jimmy out of bed and say, uh -huh. can, can you help us out down here? Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes things happen before anybody can get there. So then we would work on the community response. And I'll give you an example from Sri Lanka because it just, it, 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 it's such an interesting example. You know, this was a um, conflict between Sinhalese, Buddhists, and Tamils, a variety of uh, mm -hmm. ethnic groups and religious persuasions. And mm -hmm. So one day into a Tamil community, uh, some Sinhalese Buddhists brought a, a big Buddha. <laughs> and this was just, just okay. unacceptable and mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. provocative. Yep. And so people were gonna start fighting over the Buddha. Well, our, 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 the first thing we did was to protect the Buddha which I thought was kind of cute. We usually protect mm -hmm, people, mm -hmm. but in this case, okay, we yep. protected the Buddha. Okay. And, and then started um, mobilizing some of our, our relationships with some of the, the, the Buddhist uh, religious people and the Muslim religious people to reach their parishioners to not exacerbate the situation. So the Buddha did get pretty much trashed. Oh. I think oh. it may be the only trashed Buddha in the world. <laughs> um, but so some violence already occurred just, just in the um, ensuing moments, but uh, we were able to, to respond by getting the community itself. All, of, all these people are people that we knew, okay. both on the Sinhalese side and, and the Muslim and Tamil and uh, all the people that we knew we're able to say, yeah, we don't, we don't need this to turn into violence. Okay. And so they were right. successful in that. Okay, so you were able to calm the tensions and uh, right. get some perspective so, going and... and uh, so the way this works is we not only know the people, but we're living in the area. Mm -hmm. We live in those communities. And so when something happens, we can respond. And we can be there uh, when there's just issues that are potential for violence. So in uh, Sri Lanka, you know, the assassination of a minister mm -hmm. would provoke mm -hmm. violence across the country. Mm -hmm. So we would be out there in our uniform, which is usually just a vest and a hat, uh, and just watching. And people would feel comfortable because we were there because they felt like if we were there, they would be okay. And so mm -hmm. part of this was also to look out for kids, okay. kids that might be abducted. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a kind of presence. The other kind of presence that we have is personally accompanying people like I did in Guatemala. Every day we would go out with an individual person who was at risk and protect mm. her in this case and be with her on the bus, in the car, at a meeting, sitting at the door while she was conducting an interview. Hmm. Uh, hmm. So it, it, it really is amazing, the power of presence. I think we all know that in our own personal lives, but we don't think to translate it into international relationships and the fact that an unarmed person who is known to be nonpartisan, non-taking sides, mm -hmm. and there's a, well, let's say it's a funeral. 
again, a, a time of um, p potential for violent conflict, mm -hmm. it can just have a calming effect. Mm -hmm. So our, our two overall missions are reduce violence, pr reduce or prevent violence, as we would if we were peacekeeping there. Mm -hmm. and, and secondly, to make sure civilians are safe. So protect civilians, okay. yeah. provide safe spaces for them to do the work that's legitimately theirs. In, in armed conflict, sometimes the armed parties try to make decisions about what a community should look like when they're all done. Mm -hmm. And we say this is the job of civilians. So we may um, invite, uh, people may ask, call a meeting and ask us to be there. So we're there on the outside, um, maybe at the door, maybe inside, just to give people a feeling of confidence so they can discuss the situation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if they want to make decisions. Okay. All right. I see. So personal relationship. So, yes. Okay. And presence. Uh, you mentioned presence. The, the fact of presence. So. And and I, I would say um, one other thing is is dialogue. Hmm. And we do a lot of that because dialogue is in my, in my definition two way listening. So uh -huh. listening is. Um, I'm trying to really understand what you're saying and experiencing, and in the dialogue, we're both doing that for each other. Okay. It's not a problem-solving situation. So hmm. we do that very hmm. often, hmm. even in, in family groups. Uh, we, we use dialogue just so people know how other people are experiencing the situation. And if they want to okay. go on to do problem-solving, we will also protect people who are doing the mediation hmm. That's, mm. And usually that's local people. Interesting. Okay. All right. So I'm sold uh, and uh, I'm uh, out there and uh, I want to know more about this. So uh, what would it look like if I say, hey, I want to, I'm convinced I want to be one of you. What, okay. I, what do I do? You want to be a peacekeaker, right? Is Absolutely. That what okay. Because so. there, there are a number of ways to get involved. Okay. One is to support our peacekeepers, All but right. the other is to become a peacekeeper. Um, <clears throat> We, are, we routinely hire uh, for peacekeepers. Uh, if we get a grant, we can open up a new team, open up a new area. So every, literally every dollar of our peacekeeper money helps us reach mm. out further to mm. new communities mm. to protect them in violent okay. conflict. Mm. So peacekeepers, so we were looking for peacekeepers who, you know, over 25, have some courage, don't get all scared. Uh, are somewhat committed to nonviolence, at least on a, a, a pragmatic basis, um, and are hard workers because these are sometimes 18 hour days. Ouch. Um, <laughs> some of our peacekeepers who are working on this uh, cattle, uh, cattle keeper um, farmer conflict um, took, uh, to get to the site took. Um, um, a vehicle, then had to get on a bike, and finally it's muddy, rainy season, so wow. they're walking and they're, they're, their boots are so full of mud, they have to, you know, sort of pull them up every step. Oh. So, I mean, I mean, this is what you could expect to get into as a peacekeeper. But peacekeepers are men and women, and they're from all around the world. So the U.S. presence is maybe for our peacekeepers, but people around the world, Japan, Burma, uh, Philippines, um, Europe, Germany, uh, Egypt. We have peacekeepers from all over the place. Wow. So we have 10 applications for every position. Wow. So um, we, we don't have to do a, a lot of recruiting. People love this. And um, so um, uh -huh. I guess it's just a matter of if people want to be peacekeepers, getting their application in. Oh, all right. Hanging getting in there with it. Getting an application yep. in. Okay. So, but, but being a supporter, that's a little easier. Okay. And we, we, the individual donors are the ones who make all the new teams possible uh, with our funding. Uh, and the thing I like most as a donor is that the organization's very frugal. Okay, are, are not wasting my money, huh? Not wasting money on fancy offices or desks. We, we have an office and a church building for which we pay the, the heat and the, and the Xerox machine. And uh, our, our staff often stays overnight with donors. 
uh, in their homes mm. and uh, gets a bite to eat. Uh, so we do not have big travel budgets, but we do a lot of traveling. Wow. So we work a lot with people in local communities who love NP and, and hope that they can help us find more. And a lot of people just say, tell me how to, tell me how to be part of this because people want to know that their money is actually making a difference. Not just generally floating around there for the concept. Mm -hmm. They want to mm -hmm. know, is my money actually making a difference? Yes. And we can say that. Interesting, interesting. So um, it's an international organization mm -hmm. uh, based in Brussels, I believe, but, but uh, the U.S. Um, uh, office is? Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Yeah, and that's because a lot of our donors are from the U.S., and we do a lot of outreach here with our U.S. donors. And we're, we're moving in other directions now. So uh, with our Brussels office and our, our Brussels staff, we'll be working fundraising in, in uh, Europe and Asia and oh. all, uh, many places. And of course, you know, as we do outreach, people, people just say, hey, I want to I wanna be part of this. So sometimes it's pretty easy. I would say so. it, it does make a, a lot of sense, after all, and, it does. and, uh, and, and so I, it, it speaks to people on that level. So um, you get out in the community and, uh, and talk about uh, what you're doing and, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and educate people. Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing this on two levels. One is at the donor level. I give a lot of presentations to Rotary, which, after all, is a peace organization and has has rotor clubs all around the world, so I do that. Uh, churches, mm -hmm. uh, we do presentations, slideshows, so people like to see, well, what do those peacekeepers look like? And what do the people you're working with look like? And so we do that a lot. And then we're going to do some peacekeeper training for the United Nations, and we're actually un underway on that. And um, mm. so we're looking forward to joining forces with with um, actually since the UN trains UN peacekeepers. Uh, and so we're looking for ways to complement the work of the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations. And uh, um, Fascinating, see. fascinating. Oh, well, and one last question. We have uh, just a few seconds left, but I understand you are a Unitarian Universalist nowadays. I am, I am. Uh, White Bear Unitarian and uh, part of the Social Action Committee. Our church is a big funder of Nonviolent Peace Force. That is great. So you are living out your Unitarian Universalist yeah. values uh, mm -hmm. uh, with this organization, getting the right. word out and, uh, and trying to, uh, well, you are making the world a better place. I mean, the big joke is, yeah. you know, world peace, you know, but uh, you're actually working on world peace. And well, uh, that's... The, the theory is you solve small conflicts you also are reducing big conflicts and making peace in little areas. You make peace yeah. overall. And so making world peace is not just a, um, a crazy, uh, super idealistic thing. You not can actually all. do it. Very concrete. You, you can figure out how to do it and you That's can actually right. do it. It has been wonderful talking with you. Thank you so much for coming in today. You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. I'm David Breeden. I'm the senior minister at Unitarian Universalist congregation uh, right here in Minneapolis, and it's great to see a fellow Unitarian Universalist out there working away. Thank you so much. You're welcome.